Emmanuel, come, Emmanuel, we are waiting. Come, Emmanuel, we long to see you. Come, Emmanuel, we are waiting. Let's pray. Gracious God, we thank you for being with us throughout this day, and as we gather together in your name as your people to meditate on your word in this final series of our Bible studies. We ask that you would be with us in our minds, in our hearts, and in our lives. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So, friends, we are today on our final session in these four-part Advent series. The Word Became Flesh was our overall theme, and today, the final session, we focus on that very theme because we're going to be spending most of this evening looking at that final verse in John's Gospel, chapter 1 and verse 14. The Word became flesh and lived among us. As I was reflecting on tonight's session, it struck me that if you, if you think back of the previous three sessions that we've had, roughly say each session was about one hour, maybe a little less than an hour. We have actually spent three hours on the first 13 verses in John's Gospel. And that is a considerable amount of time. I did caution you at the very start in our first session that we are going to do a deep dive. So I think three, three, three hours for 13 verses is quite a deep dive, I must say. And I do hope that it has helped to have a better grasp of the thinking and the theology behind John's gospel, especially in these opening statements that he makes in order for us to understand the, the glory of God who came to be with us, to share our lives and to lift us back into his presence. And today in that 14th verse of John's gospel, we pull together everything that we've been considering and reflecting and thinking about over the past three weeks, because in many ways, John chapter 1, verse 14, is like a climax, a great grand crescendo where everything comes together. The, the, the final glorious movement of an orchestral suite where all the instruments that have been silent for a moment, they all come together in that grand closing finale. And that's what John chapter 1, verse 14, you, you could argue that on to 14 to 18, but I think 14 in itself serves as the pinnacle of what John has been leading up to. And I remember at some stage in my ministry when I did a stint with the, with the, with the Scottish Episcopal Church, which has strong connections with the, with the Church of England, on Christmas Day, when the gospel is read, especially the gospel from John chapter 1, verses 1 to 14, when the, it was a high church that I'm talking about, and when the priest, when the vicar gets to that line in chapter, four, in chapter 1, verse 14, where he says, and the word became flesh and lived among us, the, the, the altar servers and the choir and everybody would, would genuflect, they would, they would go down on one knee at that point, just for a few seconds, 30 seconds of silence. But it marked in a very dramatic way that hugely important truth that God became a human being. You can argue and say that it's rather ceremonial and over the top. Be that as it may, every tradition marks things differently. But the point that I'm trying to make insofar as this session is concerned is that that truth the word became flesh, God became a human, is something that when we think about needs to or ought to stop us in our tracks and reflect on the significance of it all and ask ourselves, what is it about and how does it impact us? How does it impact our faith? How does that impact the way we live? Just comprehending or trying to comprehend that truth that God, the creator of the universe, came to live with us. 
And that's what John is building up to. So if you just bear that first part, and we, we will look at the whole verse in more detail, but for now, I just want you to hold on to that first sentence. In effect, four words, the word became flesh and lived among us. You, you, you can add that on, I'll come back to that. But in order to, to understand the implications of what is being said here, I need to recap very quickly and very briefly what we have been considering and reflecting and thinking about over the last three sessions. So if you remember what I was talking about specifically in the first session, because I spent a lot of time on the first session, where John introduces the, for the want of a better word, the subject of his, of the prologue, the foreword, the word, the logos. And I said in that session, he makes some very profound statements. He talks about the word being with God as a separate entity, as a separate being from God. And at the same time, the word was identical to God because he says the word was with God, the word was God. He also said in verse three, that the word identical and yet separate from God was instrumental in bringing into existence everything that existed. Nothing came into being without the word being involved in its existence. So the word had a powerful role in bringing about creation existence. And I said at that point that John was actually drawing parallels with Genesis, the story of creation, Genesis chapter one, where God spoke, God used a word, God said, let there be, and things started to be. And so all, all those echoes, I spoke about echoes, hearing behind what is being said, those connections with other parts of the Bible, with the Old Testament, with the New Testament. That was what John was building up, saying that this powerful word was, in fact, God, was different from God, and yet had all the potentials and the abilities and capabilities of God. This word was instrumental in creation. And as the subsequent verses unfolded, which we have been looking at over the past three sessions, we saw that this word was the source of life. So it was not just inanimate creation that he brought to being, but he brought, him, he brought forth life. In him was life. He, John spoke about this word being light. And we, we, we also looked at that and we saw that in the, in the scriptures, in the Old Testament, in the New Testament, light is a quality of God, the God who dwells in unapproachable light. Or other verses of scripture says that God is light and in him there is no darkness at all. And so the, the words, the concepts, the language that John uses in describing the word and the qualities and the attributes of the word, you immediately begin to think that this word is not ordinary. This word has to be divine. John is speaking about the word using divine language, the language that one would normally and ordinarily use when speaking about God. So the word was everything that God was. And we saw in last week's session, he builds up to say that as important as this word was, light, life, agent of creation. Nevertheless, belief was important. Belief, well, more than just important, belief was integral to to accepting this dynamic word. Only to those who believed, God 
enabled them, gave them the power to become children of God, his very own family. But in order to be incorporated into the family of God, in order to feel that we were part of God's children, part of God's promised kingdom, we needed to believe. So there's this huge buildup that John creates for us in the first 13 verses. He creates a sense of wonder, a sense of anticipation, a sense of this word is special. This word is different. Those are all the feelings that need to be evoked when we think or when we read of the word as presented to us by John. And it's, it's really important for us to realize that when we come to the, to the Bible, the, whether it's the Old Testament or the New Testament, whether it's the Gospels or the, the, the letters, the epistles, the prophets, these people who wrote these documents were people who were inspired by God. They wrote under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. And so they were not just random thoughts that were scribbled down when they felt like it. They had thought about it, they had reflected on it, they had prayed about it, and God helped them, God guided them, God enabled them to put it forth in a logical and understandable manner for subsequent readers in subsequent generations. So it's a bit like a modern day author. If an author sits down to write a book, he knows his subject matter well, and he doesn't just come to us with disjointed ideas. He comes to us, especially if you were, if you were to read a, a novel or something like that. There is a sequence. There is an order so that the plot is, or, or the characters are introduced, the plot is introduced, and then things begin to unfold, and it all comes together, it all gels. It, they, they aren't just loose strands here and there and everywhere. It's all gradually and steadily and sequentially pulled together. So if you think of that for an ordinary human author who, who, who uses creativity and talents that comes from God, Think about these gospel writers. Think about the, the, the writers of the old the people write the words of God under the inspiration of God so that people would come to faith in God. How much more would their minds have been inspired and, and, and focused on what they were trying to convey? And John's gospel is certainly like that. There is a sequence to what he's writing. He's bu gradually building up to something. And in the introduction to this evening session, I spoke about John chapter 1 and verse 14 as the great climax, the apex, the pinnacle of what he's trying to say in his prologue, in his foreword. So bearing in mind all that I've been saying here now when I've tried to summarize and recap verses 1 to 13, this is what the word was. This is how the word was. These are the natures and the qualities and the attributes of the word. This word shares everything about God. This word is God. He builds it all up slowly, steadily, gradually. And then it comes with all its force, with all its wonder, with all the... The, the strength that it can muster in that one simple statement. This word that we've been thinking about for 13 verses, that we've been building up in 13 verses, this word became flesh. A huge shift. Let's talk about that shift now. I know various modern versions of the Bible particularly the message, which is a very contemporary rendering of the gospel, says something like, the word became a human. 
and rightly so, because Jesus was in fact a human. But I want to stick with the word flesh for the time being. And I'll tell you why, and hopefully it would make sense as we uh, as we proceed. Again, to give you an example, from time to time, whether I'm a vegetarian, I'm not a vegetarian, I like meat, and I sometimes jokingly say, I'm carnivorous. I sometimes say, I am like a carnivore. I like meat. If you were to ask me to name a dish, I would say my favorite dish, but again, for the sake of this example that I'm going to share with you, I would say I like chili con carne, Mexican dish. We talk about our base nature, our carnal nature that causes us to like certain things, desire certain things. And if you've been listening carefully to all of the words that I've been using, whether it was the word carnivorous, carnivore, chili con carne, carnal nature, the one word that stands out is the word carne. It comes in all of those words, carnivore, carnal, to chili con carne. And carne in the Latin language literally means meat or flesh. So let me give you another word that has that carne interwoven into it. And the word is incarnation. Do you see where this is going? So incarnation talk about as a great theological concept when we talk about the incarnation perhaps people outside of the church may not be familiar with it but i'm sure those of us within the church have come across the word literally it means the enfleshment becoming flesh it's a loose translation of the latin and the Latin, which was the official language at one time, up to the fourth century, used the word incarnation to describe what is taking place in John chapter 1, verse 14. The word became flesh. An enfleshment took place. An incarnation happened. So what is this incarnation? It's the change of state from, from, from something in something else. A shift from, in this case, something abstract to something concrete. What do I mean by that? The word was with God, abstract statement. The word was with God an abstract statement, because when we talk about a word, even in a contemporary sense, the words that I'm saying to you now, what is a word? A word is something abstract. You cannot grasp it. You cannot touch it. You cannot hold it. It's intangible. The word was light. What is light? In abstract, intangible. The word was life. Abstract, intangible, you cannot hold life in sense. The word world in creation. The rescue. Right, so I was saying, so John has built up to this stage where something that was abstract, whether he talks about life or, or, or light or all the qualities of God create in creation, taken on a concrete form. All of that has now become a human being, has taken on flesh. And when you think about it, you, you realize what a huge truth that is, because until now we were talking about 
huge abstract truths, broad strokes of the brush. And then he suddenly gets really specific. And he says, all of this has now been focused and honed on into the one individual, Jesus. The word became flesh. So all these lofty concepts that he's been talking about, all these attributes and qualities of God, qualities that could not be touched, could not be held, they all of a sudden are in a concrete form because they are now in a human being. Which is why Paul in his letter to the Colossians verses chapter one, verses 15 to 21, talks about this God, about Jesus, who Paul describes as saying, in him, that's in Jesus, all the fullness of God, the fullness of God chose to dwell. That's another way of saying the word became flesh. Everything that goes has now suddenly become a human being in the person of Jesus. A dynamic truth, the word became flesh. But not only that, in the New Testament or certainly during the time of the New Testament, flesh, which is why I said I want to focus on the word flesh, rather than the word human. Flesh was seen as something that was opposed to God. God was in the realm of the spirit and humans and earthly things were in the realm of the flesh, which is why in John's gospel, for example, chapter, uh, chapter three and verse six, Jesus says that which is of the flesh is flesh and that which is of the spirit is spirit. And he's making a distinction between heavenly things and earthly things, the things of God, the things of man. And so. In certainly in the first century, in the thinking of the first century, in the religious thinking of the first century. The flesh was seen to be something lower than God. But by Jesus taking on human flesh, what does that mean for us? It means that he is raising the level of this flesh that until then was seen to be corrupt, until then was seen to be evil, until then was seen to be sinful, in fact. But nevertheless, he chose to be flesh. He chose to become a human. That is the wonder and the mystery and the glory of the incarnation. Paul, in his letter to the Galatians, the fourth chapter, in the fourth verse, he says, When the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his son, born of a woman, born under the law, in the guise of or in the form of sinful flesh. Because flesh was seen to be evil. Flesh represented humanity. And humanity was everything that God was not. Humanity was limited. Humanity was finite. Humanity was full of shortcomings. Humanity was full of sin. And all of this comes together in that truth when John says the word became flesh. And so for a first century reader who's accustomed to thinking of the flesh as being limited and evil and, inf and finite and sinful, that's a mind-blowing thought. God became a human being. God took on a body of flesh. God took on my body, a human body, with all its limitations. And yet, God wasn't limited because Jesus 
was God. And so it's it's mind blowing if you if you've attended one of these during Christ, the Christmas season festival of nine lessons and carols, particularly the one from King's College, if you've seen that, or seen orders of service that replicate a festival of nine lessons and carols. The nine lessons each have a kind of title. So it starts off with the story of, of, of Adam and Eve and the fall of humanity and, and then God sending things to the promise. And each of these readings have a title that describes the content of the reading. And it builds up to the ninth lesson, which inevitably is from John chapter one, verses one to 14, in every festival of nine lessons and carols. And the heading, the title for that, for the ninth lesson is, Saint John unfolds the mystery of the incarnation. It is a mystery. We cannot comprehend it. And I think we, because of the way Christmas has become, and we, J Jesus has to share center stage with, 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 with a snowman or with a reindeer or with Santa Claus or whatnot. We've drifted so far away from the mystery and the glory and the wonder of the incarnation where God became a human being. And that's what we need to keep in mind. And that's what we need to focus during Christmas. And it's, it's sad. I, I find it really unfortunate when, when like, like I said, all of these additional characters of, of, of snowmen and reindeers and all kinds of polar bears with Santa hats and penguins with Santa hats and pugs with Santa hats. Everything now has become part of Christmas. But that's not a mystery. That's mundane. That's every day. That doesn't make sense. That's just ordinary fun for, well, because as, it, as that song says, just the season to be jolly. I think it's also the season to be silly to a large extent. But the truth, as John reveals it, is that God became a human. And nothing, nothing can stand up to that truth. The, the word became flesh. And the second part of that sentence, if that isn't, something that needs to stop us in our tracks, the word became flesh. The second hugely significant statement that John makes related to that is that the word became a human or the word became flesh and lived with us. So God is now wearing a human body, but that human body isn't, out there for us to admire and for us to look at and say, well, all very nice for God to become a human, but he's too far away to be of any practical value or use to us, to me. No, that's not what it is. God became a human and lived among us. He chose to come into this world, our world, my world, the world with that is broken, a world that is corrupt, a world that is sinful, a world in which we live, a world in which God lives. The word became flesh and lived among us. Again, going back to the message translation of the Bible, John 1 verse 14 says, word became a human being and moved into our neighborhood. And that's what it is. God chose to share our life. That's the statement that John makes. So everything that he's been saying up to now builds up to that one huge truth. God is now no longer distant. God is no longer far away. God is no longer unapproachable, who lives in unapproachable light. While all that is true, God has come to be 
with us. That's why that great truth from Matthew's gospel, the birth narrative of Jesus as recorded in Matthew chapter 1 verses 18 to 25, the angel talks about, and he shall be called Emmanuel, which means God is with us. And unfortunately, some of these terms, Emmanuel, we sing throughout Advent, O come, O come, Emmanuel. Because these words and ideas have become so common and so part of our churchy language, if we're not careful or if we're not conscious about what we're saying, it just washes over us. And it happens to all of us, myself included where we just use these phrases because they've been used for the past 2,000 years. But to say, Emmanuel, God is with us. God has come to be with us. An incarnation has happened. The word has become flesh. The word has become a human being and has now moved in to our neighborhood, is now sharing our world whose feet in Jesus walked the same earth that we walk on. You begin to see things in perspective. God with us. And things can never be the same again once we grasp that truth that God is with us. It doesn't stop there. The word became flesh and dwelt among us. And then this is John talking, and we beheld his glory. There are many ways of understanding this, but this is probably John as, as the author making a kind of claim for being an eyewitness as somebody who saw Jesus, who walked with Jesus, who touched Jesus, who participated in Jesus's ministry. And we see this in, in, in the letters of John, the first letter of John, chapter one and verse one, he talks about that which we saw with our eyes and touched with our hands, heard with our ears. We declare to you, we declare these things concerning the word of life. And so John says right from the start, that he was an eyewitness. All of these things I'm telling you because I know them firsthand. That's what John is saying. And remember, we looked at this in our last session where we looked at, at, at the purpose of John's gospel in John chapter 20 and verse 31. He says, I write these things to you so that you may know that Jesus is the Christ, the son of the living God, and that by believing in him, you would have eternal life. Right at the start, he said that at the end of the gospel, and he says that at the start of the gospel, we, we as in John and those who are with him, beheld his glory. Take the incident of the transfiguration of Jesus, which you can read about in, in, in Matthew chapter, sorry, Mark chapter 9, it comes in all of the gospels. You know the story where Jesus went up to the mountain and he took with him Peter, James and John. And he was transfigured in front of them. And Matthew and Mark and Luke describe that and say his whole appearance was changed and his clothes became dazzling white in a way that no launderer could even achieve those kind of effects. That kind of dazzlement, that kind of shining, that kind of glow, that kind of glory. John was there on that mountain. We beheld his glory. Glorious of the only begotten of the Father. That's another statement that he makes. This glorious word that he's talking about can only be somebody, can only belong to somebody who comes from God the Father. Glory is of the only begotten of the Father, the only begotten Son. 
In other words, the only begotten means a unique one, one of a kind. Only Jesus, nobody else, nobody else can achieve what Jesus has achieved. Nobody else can be given that honor and glory that Jesus had. And we see that again systematically through the New Testament, especially through the Gospels. Remember the baptism of Jesus? A voice came from heaven saying, this is my beloved son with whom I'm well pleased. Or on that same Mount of Transfiguration in the story, in, in the incident that I was telling you about, where Peter and James and John saw Jesus in all his glory, a voice came from heaven and said, this, this is my beloved son. Listen to him. The only begotten of the father. Nobody else in all of creation could share in the glory that was given to Jesus by his father. Another great passage, which I referred you to last week from, from Philippians chapter 2 and verses 8 onwards. After Jesus was obedient to death, death on the cross. God gave him a name that was above every other name, that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow, every tongue should confess that Jesus is Lord on heaven and on earth and under the earth to the glory of God the Father. The only begotten of the Father. We sing in one of our contemporary hymns, Jesus shall receive the highest honor. We sing majesty, Worship his majesty. And that's what we're talking about here. We beheld his glory. Glory as of the only begotten of the Father. Full of grace and truth. Those qualities of graciousness. Not graciousness as we know it or we use it. As in so-and-so is either a graceful person or he's or she is gracious enough to overlook that comment. We're talking about something more than that. We're talking about one of the great attributes and qualities of God, of being gracious. The, in, in the Old Testament, the equivalent that you'd be familiar with is the concept of steadfastness or loving kindness the qualities of god so it's not just gracious in he or she is a gracious person it is we're talking here about the qualities of god steadfastness righteousness and truth god is truth there is no falsehood in God. There is nothing that can cause us to question the integrity or the truthfulness of God. God speaks and it is done. There are no half measures. There are, there's no beating around the bush. God, by his very nature, is truth. And so when John talks about, here is this Jesus who has now become a human being, bringing in all the qualities of God, he adds to that two more qualities, grace and truth, steadfastness and mercy, if you please, faithfulness, all of those qualities of God now rest upon Jesus. And all that comes together in that one verse, the word became flesh, and lived among us. And we, that's John, and as an eyewitness, and those who are contemporary to John, have beheld his glory. And he qualifies that statement, glory as of the only begotten, one of a kind, of the Father, someone who is full of grace and truth. So you begin to understand why John chapter 1 and verse 14 is the high point of those first 14 verses in John's gospel. You begin to realize that this is the statement, the punchline 
that John was working towards. He was building it up to say, well, I've said all of this. I've painted the background for you. I've created a context for you. Now you are ready to receive that final punchline. God became a human being. God took on flesh and lived with us. And yet, and yet, we can say this with authority, with assurance, with confidence, with conviction, because we saw it. We are eyewitnesses of him. We beheld his glory. And that glory that we saw is an unparalleled glory, nothing like it. It belongs to the Father, God the Father's only Son, who is full of grace and truth. That is the mystery of the incarnation. That is the glory of the incarnation. And that is where John was leading up to and building up to. So we've been looking at various concepts as we pull this series to a close. We, we, we started off by looking at the word. We then moved on to still thinking about the word, but thinking of the word as light. In our third part, we considered what the word and light was, but looked at it from the perspective of belief. All of this becomes relevant only when someone believes in the word. And in believing, we receive eternal life. In believing, we become children of God. And so moving on from belief, today we've been focusing on the word as flesh. The word became flesh and all the implications that that means and everything that it pulls together in saying that the abstract has become concrete. The faraway God has come near. The dwell, as Revelation chapter 21 says, the dwelling of God is now among mortals, among human beings. God, in his love, in his mercy, out of the abundance of his grace, chose to share our world, to live our life, to die our death, to overcome death, and to raise us all to glory. And that's what we talk about throughout Advent and in Christmas and beyond, that God is and forever will be Emmanuel, for he is with us forever. Amen. Emmanuel, come Emmanuel, we are waiting, come Emmanuel, we long to see you, come Emmanuel, we are waiting, come Emmanuel.